Okay, well then we'll go ahead and get started. I'm excited about this lecture. I like this topic a lot um, because it's a simple concept. It's something that you all use all the time, every day, if you're writing programs every day, like I am. <laughs> so uh, you'll probably run into this kind of thing quite a bit, and we're going to understand how it works today. So we talked previously about uh, how... C doesn't do much to prevent us from doing stupid things. That's kind of the big issue with C. Um, we had this example with the array bounds checking, which we kind of glossed over a little bit, but this is what we talked about uh, on the last day when we were exploring structs and so forth, that uh, we can do things that are naughty, and the compiler does not stop us. And depending on what is, um, you know, what, what choices the compiler makes, we may end up with all kinds of disastrous things happen, or we, we may end up with nothing at all happening, okay? Which is also completely possible that you end up with nothing exciting happening, and so that way, you know, in that case, you ship your program, you think everything is fine, and then later on your customers get hacked and they lose all their data, and it's your fault, okay? And you don't want to be that guy. You don't want to be that person. Okay, so let's say that we start adding checked accesses to our arrays. And um, to do that, we really need to have some kind of metadata so that we can start checking accesses against what is the array size, details like that. So notice we have kind of an unusual way of laying out this data structure now. We have length as the first thing, and then we have whatever the value is, we don't really care. That's um, immaterial to this discussion. But then we have values, and you notice that values doesn't specify how many elements it has. Okay? So this is one of the things you're allowed to do in C. You can say, I have an array at the end of my struct, but I'm not going to tell you what size it is. Okay? And so if you want to allocate a new array on the heap, then in malloc you say, hey, this is the size of array underscore t, and then this is how many elements I want. And again, I want you to understand that malloc doesn't really treat this in any way like a type. All you're doing is telling malloc, this is how many bytes I want. <laughs> that's all malloc knows, that's all malloc cares. And so you're saying whatever the size of array underscore t is, and then I want n elements, so multiply n by the size of value underscore t, which is the element type of our uh, array. Okay. Then you go into your array and you set the length equal to n so that now the array knows what size it is. Yay, we have metadata. Okay, any questions? Now I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about this because uh, it's, it's an interesting construct that you can do in C. You'll see that I have a picture at the bottom of how A is laid out. And you might be asking yourself, well, where is values stored? Values is something that the compiler knows, but it's not something that's actually included in the data structure layout itself. So you'll notice that values is going to be a pointer that starts at a certain offset from the beginning of A, but that's a computed thing. And it'll be used by the compiler to do array indexing into values, but it isn't actually stored in the struct. Yes, question? So how would padding work with this? That's a really good question, and I'm only going to hazard a guess at this because I haven't done a lot of exhaustive experimenting. But uh, you can see that our array length is an int. So if our value t were an 8-byte thing, then it would want to be aligned on 8-byte addresses. So you could imagine that there would be 4 bytes of padding <laughs> after length to make sure that values start at 8-byte boundaries. Okay? And you could go ahead and extend that thought process to um, other data types. Like, what if value t was a struct and no member was larger than four bytes? Okay. Well, in that case, then structs, those, those uh, values elements, would be aligned on four byte boundaries. There would be no padding after length because we don't need to. And, uh, you know, the struct would be padded as following the rules that we've discussed previously. So that's my guess. As yeah, so the thing is, is that size of array t is going to include padding. So, for example, going back to the possibility that, like, let's say value t was a long, and so you know it's 8 bytes. Well, in that case, 
the compiler knows that size of array t is 8 because we need 4 bytes for length and then we need 4 bytes of padding. <coughs> and then you add in the, the size of the, uh, the uh, elements. Okay, does that answer the question? All right, so that's my best guess for now. I'm pretty sure it's right, but obviously experiments with compilers is the only way to know for sure. Okay? Any other questions? There is an example of this in the assignment, in assignment four. Um, one of the types that SubPython knows how to store is a string, and this is exactly how we store strings. There's some metadata up front, and then there's like a char square brackets, and we just allocate a chunk of memory large enough to hold the string value at the end of it. Okay, so you'll see some examples of that. Now we can start doing more clever things with arrays. So we can say a dot length, for example, and it's there. We know how many elements are in the array, and we can be clever and not go past it. Um, if we were really smart, then somehow we'd figure out a way for length to be read-only, though. Okay. And also, we would find a way to make sure that when we do square brackets on a, that we check those array bounds. Okay. You already notice that this is a little bit different than what we had on the previous slide, right? I'm saying a square brackets i, not a arrow values i or something like that, right? So we're trying to figure out how can we, how can we construct this higher level of abstraction that starts giving us more safety, okay? You may recognize that this is very similar to how Java works, okay? So if we were really cool, then we'd have an abstraction where we could have types that have behaviors as well as some kind of guards about their internal state, and some things are read-only, some things are read-write, and so forth. Okay? So you can see we're starting to tiptoe into the world of object-oriented programming, okay? where we actually have some encapsulation of state and exposure of behaviors, and we can govern state changes really cleanly. Okay, So here's the idea. Uh, we group together related data values into a single unit, and then we have functions that are able to operate on those data values. And so the state and the behavior together is called an object. We've all used them. I mean, if you've taken CS1, you've done a lot of object-oriented programming, and if you've done CS2 and, and so forth, then you've done a lot of object-oriented programming. So in the context of languages like C++, Java, and uh, to a lesser extent other languages like Python where you can really modify the, the definition of a class at runtime, it's kind of wild that you can do that, but you can. Um, the class becomes a blueprint of what goes into objects of that type. So a class defines a type and then it also uh, specifies what goes into objects of that type. And then there's these two properties of object-oriented programming or principles underlying it that are really important. One is encapsulation. We want to obscure the state that's used to implement our objects because if people can't muck with it, then they can't mess it up. That's the whole idea. Okay? So we have accessors and mutators that control when and how state can be modified. The other aspect of this is called abstraction, which is the realization that generally people don't even care how things are implemented. They just want to focus on solving their problem. And so you provide abstractions that are clean and simple and allow you to get your job done quickly. You know, just like this morning when I was adding read line support to SubPython, I was like, I don't care how it works, just tell me what functions to call, I'll call them and then be done. That's you know, and I suppose that if I had tons of free time, I would care how that stuff works, but I don't. You know, and I'm sure all of you are that way when you use collections and so forth. You just want to use it to do a job. So that's the idea behind abstraction. So um, the premise, <laughs> this is an idea that many people have subscribed to through the years, is that if you have an object-oriented programming approach, then it's going to make it easier to create larger pieces of software because it promotes modularity and encapsulation of state. And not only that, but um, very clean, simple mechanisms for manipulating state that the caller doesn't really know or care about but somebody who is an expert can craft, and then hopefully it'll be correct. Okay? Now, obvious caveat, not everybody agrees with that opinion, but um, in general you can see that very large software projects have been created using object-oriented programming, 
So it seems like they're on to something, but it's certainly not the only paradigm that can be used to create large software projects. Okay. And uh, because of the appeal of this approach, the widespread appeal, you have a lot of different object-oriented languages. I never thought I would put Perl or PHP in that list, but they're totally in it now. Okay. They, they, they did not have objects back when uh, they got off the ground. Okay. So we're going to look at uh, some features that you see in Java, and you see these in both Java and C++. So again, like I said uh, earlier in the class, this is going to be mostly Java, but kind of C++ at the same time. So you'll see both of these languages' capabilities pointing, uh, are poking through. So uh, Java has an object-oriented programming model. This would be a simple example of a color class you might create for representing uh, three component colors, red, green, and blue. Okay, So you have your red, green, and blue components. You have a static RGB color for a predefined color, like if you want to be able to refer to red or blue or something like that, you could add constants. And then we have various other things that we can do as well. Okay, So we have variables we know. Now we're going to call RGB color the class, a global variable, and you'll see why when we get into it in a little bit more depth. That's why it's also in a dotted line, because uh, it kind of stretches credulity to say it's a global variable, but it kind of is. Okay? We have function arguments. We're totally down with that. We know exactly how to do function arguments. We have local variables, and again, we know what to do with local variables. We can handle that. But then we also have a couple of new things in this picture. We have class variables, something that it does not exist at an object level. It exists at the class level. Okay? And then we also have red, green, and blue. Those are instance variables or object variables. So each object will have its own copy of these three components that it can manipulate all by itself. Okay? They're not shared. The class variable is shared. Object variables are not shared. And obviously, the uh, local variables and function arguments are specified on a per-invocation basis. Okay? Make sense? So this is what we're going to try to dissect today and understand how to implement this. Okay? So I asked the question, how do environments fit together to provide these kinds of state? And what I kind of mean by that is frames. And we've talked about frames. You know, there's uh, spaces for holding values of variables. Where are variable bindings stored? And that's kind of what we mean by an environment. If you've taken CS4, then you have a much better sense of what that means. But um, it's not really you know, critically important to this discussion. All I mean when I say an environment is where do we store stuff? So here's an example of how we might hook together some kind of variable binding environments. Okay? Again, at a very high level, right? we're talking about something that is uh, pretty much schematic in nature. We're just sort of drawing out what we think uh, things could look like. So somewhere we have to have an RGB color global variable so that somebody can refer to the class and we can then look up members on the class because you'll notice that RGB color has a red member. That's our red constant that we defined. That thing has to point somewhere, and that'll point to an object that stores red, green, and blue components. And in this case, red will be 1, and green and blue will be 0. And then if someone were to construct another RGB color object, then we'd need a place to store its values. Notice that initially it is just storing black. Okay, so red, green, and blue are all 0. Uh, somebody's invoking from HSV on it, though and passed in a hue of 0.5 and a saturation of 1 and a value of 1. So um, inside of from HSV, we have a local variable that's used for the computation. Okay. Everybody see what's going on? Not complicated, right? This isn't really frightening, hopefully, at this point, because uh, ideally, we already know how to do some of these things, and we just need to figure out the rest. Okay, so to support objects, we need to have new frames for classes, and then we need frames for objects as well. We need ways of storing those details. We need to introduce some mechanism for that. And uh, so we will use the memory heap just to keep it simple. Um, actually, you could do some of this on the stack as well, but we're going to use the memory heap because that tends to be the Java choice, um, is stuff, stuff things onto the heap. And uh, the neat thing is, if we use some kind of reference abstraction, we know from last lecture that we could then 
take those frames and manage them with an implicit allocator. So somebody can allocate it, and then when it's no longer in use by anyone, we can reclaim it. Okay? And Java is actually takes this to an extreme level where if you have a class definition and nobody's using the class definition anymore, it can unload it. Like the virtual machine can just say, okay, nobody's using this, I'm going to get rid of it because nobody needs it anymore. Okay? So uh, there's some really neat things that you can do in Java with uh, class definitions. Okay, so how might we implement this? We're going to talk about some very simple ways of doing this. Okay. So we're going to see how the stuff I've already shown you could translate into C. And obviously if we can translate it into C, we know we can translate it into assembly code because we've done that. So you can see that we can actually do quite a bit. Now um, we'll actually take this and go even further. Um, you probably heard of, who's heard of virtual functions? Anybody who's taken CS2 probably has heard of virtual functions or done any significant amount of C, C++ programming. Or Java programming, because remember, everything in Java pretty much is virtual. Okay? So we'll even introduce the notion of how to implement that. Okay? So we already know how to implement some of these details. We know how to pass function arguments. Again, if we were doing something really crazy, we could translate that into C. We know how a C function invocation works because we've looked at the system 5, what is it, uh, AMD 64 ABI. I can't even remember the full name of it because it's so long and tedious. But we know exactly how to implement this, right? Know how to do function calls and local variables. But then we have to figure out how do we actually store the data for an object in C. Well, we just talked about something, right? We've, you know, just like a couple lectures ago, introduced the concept of structs, right? And I'm sure all of you are already familiar with structs, but we could take this somehow and turn it into a struct. <coughs> Translation would be very straightforward. And I know I tell you this in the assignment right up in assignment four, but it's so interesting to me that I have to tell it to you anyway. Um, initial versions of C++ did literally this. They would take, their, and it was called C with classes, and there's a reason why, because <laughs> it was C with classes. And the... Um, Source code, the C++ source code, the, the uh, you know, primitive C++ source code would be sent through a compiler front end, which was just a translator that would translate it into C code and then be compiled with the C compiler. Okay. So when we see this, you can see that oh, it's a very straightforward translation that people do. Okay, so we have RGB color underscore data. So underscore data means it's for objects. And we have red, green, and blue components. Okay. So we'll use this for representing objects. Now, this is the data thing. We need a way of providing methods because we have get red, set red, get green, set green. We have uh, from HSV, we have these various operations we might want to perform. So we need to figure out a way of translating this into an equivalent C mechanism. And you'll, and you'll notice that at the bottom of the slide that there isn't an explicit argument for representing the object that we're operating on, or the object that's involved. It's indicated by the syntax, C dot, you know, where C is a color, C dot do stuff. Okay, so clearly it's an implicit parameter, but we need a way of, of incorporating that into our, our mechanism. Okay. And so you all know the punchline because you've all seen this before. We use some special variable that refers to the object being invoked upon. Okay. And uh, in Java and in C++, it's called this. In Python, we usually call it self. Um, that's the convention. You could call it anything you want. Okay. And so if we had this object-oriented code where we say set red, and we want to um, pass in a value and store that into the red component, we could translate it into some equivalent C code that takes the object that it's operating on as the first argument. And then the remainder of the member function or methods arguments would be concatenated onto the end of that. So that allows us to refer to the object that's being invoked upon. Okay? Easy, right? No problemo. <coughs> okay, so yeah. Uh, let's see what else I... Yeah. Um, 
I guess I'm just belaboring the point, although I think we're all comfortable with this. Um, yeah, so a program calls a method on an object. What happens is the underlying implementation turns that into a function call where the object is the first argument to the call and the rest of the arguments are passed as subsequent ar arguments. I mean, that's really straightforward. And Python makes this so abundantly clear. I, that's why I love that we use Python for uh, introductory programming because it illustrates some of these concepts so plainly. Okay? And, uh, you know, not to mention that I love programming in Python myself because it's a nice, simple language to use. Okay, any questions? All righty, so that's straightforward. We sometimes have methods calling other methods, like get grayscale. Maybe we want to do this using uh, get red, get green, get blue, as opposed to using the red, green, and blue components. Uh, some people feel like this is a, a good way of implementing object-oriented programs. It's not my preference, but people certainly do this. And But you see that uh, you're calling other methods on the same object. Well, in the translation, we just keep propagating the this value to these methods that we're calling. So you might have something like the RGB color, get grayscale, you pass in this, and then you just make sure that for other method invocations, you just pass along this. Okay, so it's real easy, right? Okay, now we know how to do two more boxes in our picture, right? We know how to represent RGB color red, at least the object, we know how to represent, you know, we'll have an RGB color data frame and we'll put uh, one for the red component and zero for the others. We know how to represent our other RGB color object and we even know how to implement things like from HSV and uh, all of that. So we actually have gotten quite a bit of our picture taken care of by now. Okay. What about classes though? We have a constant at the class level, which again, if you're familiar with Java or C++, then you know that you can do both of those things. Uh, I'm sorry, you can do this thing in both of those languages. Okay, you can have static uh, variables, static members. And the idea behind this concept is that that variable red is not associated with a specific object. It is an object, but it's stored at the class level. So you would say something like, RGB color dot red. That's how you would reference it from outside of RGB color. Okay? So you can see that somehow we have to have a frame at the class level that holds the definition of, of red. Okay. So um, I'm also going to assert, you're going to see the reason why a little bit later, but we're going to assert for now, why not actually have object frames reference their class frames as well? Because then it's really easy to know what type an object is. You can just go ask, you know, say, hey, what's your class? And it'll say, here it is. Okay. So this kind of thing is a very common approach in object-oriented uh, programming implementation, is that objects know their type. They have a way of referencing their type information. Okay, so this would be a really simple frame for our class. Notice again the convention. RGB color underscore data was for individual objects. RGB color underscore class is for the class level details. And we have one member in here, which is red. Okay. Now we're going to update our data definition as well to reference its class. So you can see that you know if you were implementing this with references, you'd have a cycle in the in the reachability graph, so you would need some kind of garbage collection mechanism that's clever about that kind of thing. Okay, straightforward. So here's the question, how do we initialize the static members? Because clearly we need to go set red to something so that it's not just garbage or whatever happened to be in the uh, memory chunk before we tried to start using it as a, uh, as a constant. Of course, we also haven't really talked about how to initialize objects as well. Okay? So we know that classes have constructors. Constructors have a sole responsibility of initializing the state of an object to be valid. So we'd want to initialize red, green, and blue to be something valid. Correspondingly, we need to initialize class to point to something valid. And so we'll also do what Java does, which is that we'll initialize the class details the first time the type is actually referenced. 
and load it. Okay. Maybe you're familiar with in Java where you can have a class and you have a static block in there and that will be executed initially when that class is loaded. So Java Virtual Machine has a mechanism for making sure classes get initialized properly. Okay. So here's a simple example. Notice RGB color class init. We take the RGB color class, which has already been allocated by someone, and uh, then we say class arrow red is malloc, whatever the size of uh, RGB color data is, and then we call the constructor thingy for that red uh, value, and we set its values red, green, and blue, 1, 0, 0. Okay. But we also set the class members. This might be what the constructor looks like. Notice again that you have some implicit arguments that aren't uh, necessarily listed when you write the Java code or you write the C++ code, but you just have these implicit details that need to be stored into this object as well. So we say this arrow class is the class that's passed in, this arrow red, green, and blue, we initialize all of those things, and you'll notice that we don't actually store this anywhere, but we need it to initialize the object state. Okay, questions? There's one giant super important thing to understand on this slide. And that is that when you initialize an object in a language like Java, or you initialize an object on the heap in a language like C++ using new, there's two steps involved. The first step is grabbing a chunk of memory that's the appropriate size to hold the object state. The second step is taking that chunk of memory and initializing it properly so that it now is an object. Both of these steps are important in initializing an object. And the same thing is true at deallocation time or destruction time. I've got to clean up any internal state in the object, and then I need to deallocate the memory. So this is kind of a two-step process that occurs. Anytime you say, like, Java has new all over it, and C++ code sometimes has new all over it, and that sort of captures both of those steps. Okay? Everybody got it? All right. Let's see where we are as far as time. Oh, we're in great shape. Okay. Um, we can do everything now. We are so powerful and awesome, right? Uh, we know how to do all of these different kinds of things. And uh, I think you should see that it's pretty straightforward to translate into C code. And then, you know, you can, you can run it. But what if we wanted to do something a little bit more sophisticated, like polymorphism? What the hell is polymorphism? So um, class inheritance starts to introduce a lot of interesting capabilities into object-oriented languages. Okay? So let's say that you have a type, but it's generalized. And then you want to create specialized versions of it. You want to create specific specialized versions of that generalized type with special capabilities, maybe special state, maybe special operations that are not available on the general version. Okay? So like I have on the slide, the parent class represents a general purpose type. The child class is a specialization of that type and can extend or override the capabilities in various ways. Okay? Once you have that ability to create class hierarchies, then you have a new interesting circumstance. You write a function. It takes a reference to a base type. You pass in subtype 1, and you call some function on it. How should it behave? Then you pass in subtype 2, and you call the same function. How should it behave? Okay. So this is polymorphism, that the behavior of the code reflects the types of the objects that are being acted upon, not just the code itself. Okay, that's the idea behind polymorphism. So to illustrate this example, um, or this concept, we're going to uh, make our color type a little bit more sophisticated. So we're going to have an abstract color base type, and it's not necessarily going to be RGB. It's not going to necessarily have red, green, and blue components. There's an, a lot of different ways to represent colors, it turns out. Um, red, green, blue happens to be a strongly preferred way for computer graphics hardware to represent colors. Um, has worked really well. 
is nice straightforward uh, approach for computer hardware to implement. So you can see that our base type ha still has a 2RGB operation on it that gives back a version of the red, green, and blue components that is um, very popular with graphics <coughs> hardware. Pack it all into 32 bits. Okay. And then we also have a get grayscale if we wanted to take the color and turn it into a grayscale value. Okay. And we're going to have two subclasses of this. We're going to have an RGB color subclass, which is like our previous type, which will actually have red, green, and blue components. And then we'll have another one, HSV, hue, saturation, and value, okay. which is a really great color space. I love this color space because you can do some really fun graphics with it. It also happens to have um, some useful applications in... Uh, in computer vision. Okay? But the idea is that these are just different ways of representing color. Red, green, blue has three components and then you mix these components in some way to get a color out of it. If you have full saturation on all of red, green, and blue, you get white. And if you have none of them, you get black. If you have only red, then obviously you get red and so forth. Right? And so this is the uh, way that these colors are combined. And like I say on the slide, this is used widely. So this is a nice, simple way of doing it. Then you have hue, saturation, and value, which is pretty wild. Hue ranges, for example, let's just take a really simple example. Hue will range from 0 to 1. When hue is 0, you get red. When hue is 1, you get red. And as you increase hue, it goes around the color wheel, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, and then back to red. So that's what happens as you increase hue. Uh, saturation dictates how much of the color is present. So a saturation of 0 would be white, and a saturation of 1 would be whatever color you're at for the hue. And then value sort of um, gives you the, uh, you know, is it black or is it going to be fully whatever the hue and the saturation dictate. Okay? And so this is a great color space. It, you know, if you like to render fractals or something like that, HSV is your friend. Because figuring out a fractal value and mapping that to a, a red, green, blue component is tedious. Okay, so these are different color spaces. There's even other ones besides these. Um, but you can see that we're going to need to have a couple of subtypes, one for each of these color spaces. As you would normally do with a class hierarchy, when you have a gener uh, generalized base type, then you use that to write your APIs. Okay, so you have shape.setColor. I don't care if it's a red, green, blue color. I don't care if it's an HSV color or some other kind. I just want a color. And so you can see shape.setColor takes a color. The graphics set color takes a color. We don't care what kind of color it is. Okay. And so programs can use what makes sense for them. And then the graphics code can go ahead and figure out a graphics-friendly version of the color by calling to RGB. And it'll give back that... Uh, graphics hardware friendly value. Okay? Does this make sense to everybody? Everybody with me so far? No questions? Yes? Uh, I guess it, it might be beyond the scope of what we're discussing, but uh, HSV has singularity while RGB doesn't, right? Is, am, I, am I saying it wrong? Or? Um, like, what kind of singularity would you be talking so, uh, about? I'm thinking about it in reference to like 3D rotation uh, and ways of doing 3D rotation. Um, and it seems that HSV has values where can achieve a specific color in different ways, or if you're at a specific point, you can change one of the values and it doesn't move. Yes. Um, yeah, so both of those statements are true. There are HSV, there are, for example, many HSV values that would give you black. Um, there would probably be many HSV values that give you white, and so forth. Yeah, so that's definitely true. So an HSV value is not necessarily unique. Um, and the other thing that you mentioned is also... Um, the key, like, for example, as you, as you move a particular component of the color, you're not going to see any changes just because you're in a region of the HSV space that is that way. So I think RGB in, in that manner is more interesting uh, than HSV because each triple, red, green, and blue triple, is going to give you a unique color, uh, whereas HSV isn't that way. A little bit beyond the scope, but yeah, that, that was still interesting. Okay, any other questions, comments? All right. So here's the graphics code, and this is where it gets really interesting. You can imagine that RGB color and HSV color will have different implementations of 2RGB. 
They kind of have to, right? Because they have different components from which to compute to RGB. Okay? And so um, the RGB color implementation might just you know, take all those floats, scale them by 256, and slap those values into the 32-bit um, value, and off you go, right? You're done. HSV color, though, will have to do some math. And if you're curious, you can look up the math on Wikipedia. It's not hard, but it is tedious. Nobody wants to do that. Okay. So uh, anyway, we have to do that uh, RGB conversion before we can return the result. So basically, graphics set color needs to know which version to call depending on what kind of color it's given. Okay, so this would be an example where we need this to be a virtual function invocation. Okay. All right, so two RGB and get grayscale are examples of virtual functions. And uh, the idea behind a virtual function is different subclasses provide their own versions of these functions, and the code that's written against the base type has to know which version of the function to invoke based on the object that's passed in. Okay. This is polymorphism in a nutshell. Polymorphism is a big long word to describe something simple. Okay. Don't be scared off by words. So this is where objects having a reference to their class information can be really helpful because maybe we can figure out how to use the class details to tell us which version of the function to invoke. Okay. What we will do is store information about what version of the virtual function to invoke in the class type. And then that way, when we have the object, we just take the object, look up its class, and then we can look up what version of the method to call. Okay. Now, part of the way we can do this is to leverage a feature that C has, um, which is a function pointer. You all are familiar with pointers because you're having to work with them a lot. You probably hate them right now, and that's okay. Um, I hate them sometimes too. But um, you can have pointers to functions just like you can have pointers to data. And you can use that function pointer to invoke the function that's pointed to. Okay? Here's a simple example. You have a function pointer fp, which I am declaring. That, that line is crazy, right? I mean, where's the variable name? Well, it's right smack in the middle of it. Um, what we're saying is fp is a pointer to a function uh, that takes a double as an argument and returns a double as its result. Now fp can point to anything that has that signature. Any function that takes a double and returns a double, it can point to. The sign function happens to be that way. So we could say fp equals sign. And notice I'm not saying any parentheses here because we're not invoking the function, we're just referencing it. And then I can use fp to invoke sign and pass it x and get back an answer. All right, does that make sense to everybody? It's crazy, but it's really powerful. It allows you to do some very powerful things. Um, anybody taking Mike's interpreter's class or planning on taking it in the future, this is how you build dynamic sets of functions that can be uh, invoked within an interpreter and how you can build the mechanism to create new functions, to find new functions in the future as well. Uh, function pointers in C is a very powerful mechanism. Okay, so here's what we will do in the base class. Notice this is the color class. This is not RGB color or HSV color. We have two virtual functions. So I went ahead and created two function pointers in this struct saying, hey, here's some virtual functions. The subclasses also get similar information. RGB color class says, yeah, here's my version of 2RGB, and here's my version of get grayscale. And HSV color class does the same thing. Okay. Now, this may seem a little weird, and it may scare you slightly, especially if you like languages that prevent you from doing naughty things. But you can see that uh, C doesn't have much of a guardrail as far as keeping you from doing silly things. Um, I would argue that this is not silly, and you'll see why momentarily when we talk about how this all works. But you can see that we're playing really fast and loose with types. Welcome to C. Okay. That's part of the reason why we build systems in C, because we can get away with these shenanigans. And if we're careful, it'll work. Okay, so um, here's what's going on. 
C has this interesting characteristic. You know, if you have a struct and you lay out the members of the struct, you're all familiar with how each member has a certain offset from the beginning of the struct and each one has a certain size. Okay? So we're all familiar with how structs are leveraged or how they're implemented by the compiler. And so what you can do in C is create a base type struct that has certain members that are going to be common to, to the base type and to all the subtypes. So you have color data and it's got color class. And then the subtype structs can have their own details as well, but they have to have the same prefix. They have to have the same preamble. Okay, so struct RGB color data, and you see, okay, RGB color class star class. So what's class's offset from the beginning in RGB color data? Well, it's the same as the offset in color data. So if you have a pointer to a color data, you could cast it to an RGB color data. Or if you have a pointer to an RGB color data, you could cast it to a color data, and still access the common members. Okay? So this is admittedly hinky, but totally uh, reasonable and doable in C. And there's actually many projects that do this kind of thing in C code. It's the C version of inheritance. Okay. I hope nobody's feeling really dirty yet, because uh, it, it's crazy. It's a little bit crazy. Like Postgres does this. Postgres for its uh, plan node representations uses this kind of a mechanism internally because it's written in C. Okay, class initialization. So this is the RGB color class init. Notice what RGB color's class initialization does. It squirrels away the versions of the functions that should be used for RGB color objects. Now remember, RGB color objects will know their class details, and so we can just look at the object and say, who's your class? What version do I call? Okay, same thing with HSV color. We store the HSV color versions of these functions in the HSV color class details. Okay. Everybody see how this is going to work? It's pretty cool. All right, so uh, RGB color data is the same because, you know, we cleverly thought ahead and put a class member at the beginning, okay? Same thing with HSV color data. And remember, we don't have any uh, constants in color, so color's class definition is just going to be color underscore data, and it's going to have uh, color underscore class star class. At the beginning. I mean, it's, it's uh, really straightforward. Okay, so we had this code from before. Device dot set RGB, and then we have to ask the color, what's your RGB value? Well, the way that we would translate it would be something like this. Okay. We have device dot set RGB. Okay, so we're invoking a method on device, so we know how to translate that. Device underscore set RGB. We pass in the device itself as this, so that we know what device is being operated upon. And then we have to set up its argument, c.2rgb. But in this case, we know that 2rgb is a virtual method. So we have to look up which version of the method to call. So we have this unusual calling pattern. C arrow class, like give me your class member. And then on the class member, tell me which version of 2rgb to use. Okay? That's what we have to do to get to the appropriate version. Everybody got it. You get to implement this in assignment four. It's not hard. Mostly people find it tedious, um, which is like, yeah, that's uh, just like the machine code. Do it once so you understand it and then never do it again. But at least now you understand it. Okay. Yes? Will the casting happen without any problem? Yes, because this is C. Yeah. Yeah, C will implicitly cast between the pointer types. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. If I'm wrong, then you'll find out on assignment four. But I think you all know how to cast. So you have to in assignment three anyway. But yeah, I'm pretty sure this will all just work. <laughs> right? Okay. One thing to note is this is the translated code. Notice that we have two different calling patterns here. And this is actually really important because it has... Some serious implications, maybe less serious now, but they were really serious when I was your age. Uh, Non-virtual methods do not support polymorphism. 
So we have device underscore set RGB. In this context, we're saying uh, set RGB is not a virtual function. So we don't look up on device, what's your version of set RGB? We're not asking it, we're just deciding we're going to invoke this version. Okay? So notice the method is chosen at compile time. It cannot change, so you don't get any polymorphism. And it's really fast because we chose the version to use at compile time. Okay. So you can imagine that non-virtual method invocation is preferable because it's faster. Slightly. Okay. So, um, but it's all, yeah, it's also known as static dispatch because it's decided at compile time. Virtual methods do support polymorphism. And so that's the second example, virtual method invocation. And so what you're doing is you're looking up which version of the function to call at runtime so that whatever you pass in, the code will do the correct thing. So that's why it's also called dynamic dispatch, because you're doing it on the fly. Okay? But it is slower, right? Because I have an extra lookup to figure out what is it that I'm supposed to be doing. So static dispatch is fast and inflexible, and dynamic dispatch is slower and flexible. Okay, Everybody got it? So hopefully you can all see that there's the two different uh, mechanisms involved. And again, you'll see this on the assignment as well, is that there's a, a static dispatch and a dynamic dispatch example that you have to uh, implement. Now the reason why I say it's not so important is because computers are freaking fast, and that'll probably be in caches, and the processor will know to prefetch and all that kind of malarkey that it does. But um, back when I was a frosh, you know that uh, saying, um, and C++ was still really exciting, and uh, you could actually write better assembly code than the compiler, which is rare nowadays for people to do uh, successfully anyway. Um, we would avoid virtual function invocation because it was slow. Memory was slow and we'd like to avoid that extra step of looking things up. And so you would actually take some pains to avoid this. Nowadays, we don't care. We pretty much don't care. I mean, I suppose if you were in finance, then you would care, uh, writing some you know, super fast trading system. But um, yeah, in fact, we even have languages <laughs> where dynamic dispatch is all the language does. Like Java, that's exactly what Java does. Pretty much everything in Java is virtual. Okay. Any questions about this? I don't want the class to turn into old guy rants about things, so uh, we'll keep moving. But uh, you can see how, uh, in our simple example, you can build in class inheritance and polymorphism relatively easily using existing C mechanisms. Okay? So that's a pretty dang cool feature here, or a uh, you know, way of, of hooking things together. So we have structs represent data for objects, structs for uh, classes, uh, we have virtual functions by storing function pointers in the class information, and then we can look it up off the object. Okay, So that's dynamic dispatch in a nutshell. Now, like I was saying, um, in Java, they take this to an extreme, and basically anything that's not final and static is going to be done through dynamic dispatch. Okay? Computers are fast enough. We can handle it. Now, C++ still uh, makes optimization and performance a, a high priority, and so in C++, you have to say stuff is virtual. Also, um, we had a, a kind of nice, very clear way of representing our function pointers. But real compilers don't do this. They'll just create a table of function pointers, and again, the compiler will internally know this pointer at this index takes these arguments. This pointer at this other index takes these other arguments. And it knows how to just do the translation into the code. Okay? So we had something like this, where notice we have names and types and signatures, and we're all fancy, and it looks really nice and clean. Well, um, that's a lot of type information. And so a lot of times what you'll see in the actual compiled version is just a slot number. Like, I want you to call the virtual function at slot 0. I want you to call the virtual function at slot 1. Okay? And this leads to a great deal of pain when you have uh, libraries and, you know, you break binary compat. I won't even start talking about that because I don't want to get sidetracked, and it's not really useful for the, the lecture. Um, Java, again, has an interesting approach, which it actually associates these things with names. 
So it does virtual function lookup by name, which you can imagine is slower. It only does it once, and well, once it resolves things, then it can uh, go forward. But um, that makes it a lot more resilient to certain kinds of changes. That's the reason why we do that in Java. Okay, any questions? All right, and the final note which I have here is that this is how to map something Java-like or C++-like into C. And you can imagine that this makes it um, decidedly unchangeable once you've done it. You know, you compile it and it's fixed. But um, that's not really the way that the Java virtual machine works. It has a ton of data structures to describe all of these things. Class, method, field, blah, 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 blah. It has tons of these things. And so um, it has a very sophisticated representation for class internals that the virtual machine uses. And so um, it basically allows the virtual machine to dynamically load these things and you know, pass around objects of various types, initialize objects. It knows exactly what to do. Um, if you're done using a particular type, the virtual machine can unload it because those things are now no longer in the reachability graph. So it's like, Shh, I'm checking that stuff out. And uh, you can even do things like say, I need a new version of this type. So you know, you'll just load it and start using it, and the old version goes away. Or like I have on the slide, you can generate classes from scratch using bytecode generators and so forth. Load them in and then start using them. So the Java Virtual Machine has a lot of sophistication well beyond what we talked about today. But uh, hopefully this will give you an idea of what's going on at a, at a fundamental level under the hood uh, for how these features are implemented. Okay, any questions? All right, Friday's class is exceptional we're talking about exceptions. So um, anyway, I really love this subject, so hopefully you'll come and see it. Uh, so we'll see you then.